Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to our Mabo Day celebrations for 2024. My name is Craig Senior Davies and I'm your 2024 Mabo Day host and MC. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Michael West from the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council to welcome us to country. Michael, sorry, bear with me one moment. Michael is a Gomorrah nation born, raised in Sydney, member of the Stolen Generations. Uh, Michael has had a variety of previous roles as a director of the New South Wales Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, director of Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, co-chair of the National Sorry Day Committee and delegate National Congress of Australia's First Nations People, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Advisory Committee to the Board of Headspace and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group Australian Curriculum Assessment Reporting Authority. Thank you, Michael. I, I was going to say, I didn't know I changed my name. I see over there you've got our Uncle Alan Madden. Yeah, it's a bit strange, a bit strange. Um, yes. Uh, I'd like to say Bojadi Gamaroa Gadigal Yora and good day and welcome everyone uh, to Gadigal Yora country here. And obviously Mabo Day, which is the back end of Reconciliation Week. Has everybody had a good Reconciliation Week? That's good. Um, very, a lot of enthusiasm out there. Um, I was going to say too that, you know, for Aboriginal people, I was just talking to one of the other elders and they were saying, uh, to Uncle Brendan, and we were having a conversation that there's a lot of black fellas out there that don't want to celebrate, that don't want to celebrate National Reconciliation Week and probably don't want to celebrate NAIDOC Week coming up because of the, what do you think, because of? The referendum, yes. Um, Aboriginal people's voice was rejected at the referendum. Um, I think we've made some progress, but we've still got a ways to go. I think if we're going to be honest with truth-telling as part of um, the journey forward, obviously it didn't go the way uh, Aboriginal po people wanted. When you look at the results and you look at the Aboriginal communities, what they voted, probably 80 or 90 per cent, and uh, yes. There's a long way to go, I, I think, with um, understanding. It was all we asked was a, just a voice. It wasn't any veto power. We weren't going to get the UN here to take away your land. Um, we weren't going to raise taxes. We weren't going to, buy, to advise which submarines we could buy um, or planes or Defence Force planes, and that's just ludicrous. Uh, where I was out at my um, voting booth when I went, um, <clears throat> someone from First uh, One Nation was going around saying that uh, voting for us will increase your taxes, which is a lot of nonsense, obviously. Unfortunately, there's a lot of disinformation out there, uh, a lot of crazy talk, uh, and also, I guess, tapping into the things like the, the re relationship they had with uh, Brexit and also with Trumpism. Uh, the people who were behind some of the statements were made. Things like that colonisation has been good for us. No, it has not been good for us. Uh, as a member of the Stolen Generations, for me, my family communities, I uh, don't think so. And that uh, it gave us running water and food. We always had running water. They're called rivers and streams. And we always had food, bush tucker around us. Unfortunately, communities now uh, don't have access to, to clean running water. Uh, whether through drought or pollution and not caring for country and same thing with, with food. And they have to truck water in and they have to truck food in. And obviously fresh food only lasts for a few days. There's also the issues of um, over, overcrowding and housing. Um, yes, not having the right um, foundation when you think about housing is so important and that. And we've been somewhat neglected and there should be more housing for us. And our land council, uh, we are going, we've put in an application, a journey of 20 years for our first housing, which is 450 houses over on the north side. Unfortunately, it's taken us 20 years to get to this point because the council over there actually put a no 
zoning on our land for 10 years. Not done to anyone else, um, only to us. Also, we've been told that we should probably donate our land as a park um, or the government buy it back so it could be a park. Unfortunately, some people think that Aboriginal people shouldn't be able to develop our land as anyone else, but not, not, um, <clears throat> not destroying our culture is what we want to do. We don't want to destroy and we will not destroy our culture, but we want to be able to develop our land as any other private landholder, because we are the biggest private landholder in a lot of local governments that we're in um, through the Land Rights Act of 1983. Um, that's just some of the truth telling that needs to be said. And that uh, also that it was said that there's been no ongoing effects of colonisation. If that's the case, why do we have closing the gap? Why do we have all these organisations with reconciliation action plans? And why do we have a, a child just born down the road here in a hospital like 10 to 13 years difference in life expectancy at RPA? Yes, I think we need to be honest. Uh, it's important that we do celebrate our culture and we want everyone to celebrate our culture because we are the oldest living continuous culture in the world today. Uh, we're more than 65,000 years, but we know that's, uh, that's only the start. We've been here a lot longer. We've never migrated from Africa. We've always been here. We'll be here until the end of time, I think is important to understand. And our culture and our sites is your culture and sites to, to look after and protect. But we want you to remain strong in your own identity, your own culture to practice that. I think the last few years going through this pandemic has made us realise it's important we do connect with ourselves, who our, our culture and where we're from around this beautiful planet called Earth. We only have one planet, we need to respect Mother. And um, it's important that we do protect these sites, whether you're in our culture, whether you're a, uh, born Australian or whether you're naturalised Australian. We make these points at the citizenship ceremonies that we participate in. And um, to us, you know, uh, you shouldn't be discriminated by your mode of transport, either if you come here by boat. For us, remember, Captain Cook's a boat person. Yes, Captain Cook's a boat person. <laughs> Um, what I was going to say, look, I, I think what Marbo did, Eddie Quirky Marbo did, was very important. I just saw Gail last week uh, and he took on uh, this false, this lie about terra nullius. Uh, it's always been Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders land and it will be until the end of time. We need to remember that. And um, what I was going to say too, it's important we take a moment to, to pay silence to pay respects to the ancestors as our cultures require. It's important we take pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tradition owners, elders and custodians of the past and present, for looking after country, spirit of country and culture. Uh, it's also important to remember the people we've lost in this pandemic because Aboriginal people were targeted through the pandemic um, with disinformation again, yet again. And uh, we are quite vulnerable with um, chronic care and also um, the effects of colonisation. And also um, we need to pay respects to Mother Earth. We need to uh, reflect our journey right here, right now. Not just celebrating our culture two weeks in a year, uh, Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC, and we have to be honest in our discussions. So if we have a moment of silence, a moment of paying respect and a moment of reflection, thanks. We have those three beautiful rivers that are boundaries of the Aura Nation. What are they? You've probably heard them before. Hawkesbury. Nepean and Georges. On behalf of Metropolitan and Local Aboriginal Land Council, we welcome everyone here um, to celebrate Reconciliation Week, but the end of it with um, celebrating Eddie Mar Marbo uh, and his journey of fighting um, the colonists, one might say, in uh, saying that this land has always been ours. And then also uh, I'd like to say too, it's important that we do respect our totems. Our totems are very important to us. We have um, the whale in, in Sydney here, it's Gadigal. It's also connected to the Camaragal because they've got an engraving the other side of the harbour. Um, and then also uh, we have Dinawan, which is Emu, and Banda, which is Kangaroo in central New South Wales. 
And then also um, we have a beautiful bird that's around here that's been somewhat marginalised by people. It's a white bird with black tail feathers, long legs, long neck and long beak. I'm talking about the sacred ibis. It's not only important in our culture, but also in other cultures around the world, like the Egyptian culture, uh, respects it. I, I, I'm going to say, don't call me a bin chicken. I'm not a bin chicken on the sacred ibis. It's not my fault I have to go through your bins, and I may look a little bit dirty sometimes, as he would think or she would think, because um, you haven't cared for country. I, I'm from the wetlands. I've had to migrate to the city to live with you guys. So it's all on you. So respect me, I think is important. And um, uh, I was going to say, look, um, let's have the tough conversations we have to, uh, the truth telling, because we aren't really going to go forward unless we do have those important conversations. Uh, always was, always will be Aboriginal land never ceded. Uh, let's look inside our hearts for more love. When we, when we don't see that, we look around the world today and we see some of the situations that are being played out in other, in other countries around the world. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, we can always do better and let's create a better planet. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Michael West, for your very powerful Welcome to country and reminding us to always take care of Mother Earth. Um, more formally, hello, my name is Craig Senior Davies and I am a Senior Engagement Coordinator here at the University of Sydney in the Diversity and Inclusion team. I'm a proud Darug man born and raised in Western Sydney. I want to acknowledge also and pay my respects to the Gadigal people and their elders past, present and emerging as we are on Eora Nation today. Also want to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here in the room with us today, and thank you all for taking the time to be here for this very special event. This past week is Reconciliation Week. Reconciliation Week, preceded by Sorry Day, commemorates significant dates in Australian history. The 1967 referendum, the anniversary of the Torres Strait Islander flag, and the High Court Mabo decision, known as Mabo Day, these dates all recognise the strength and determination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Reconciliation Week's theme, now more than ever, is a reminder to all of us that no matter what, we, the fight for justice and the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people must continue. Now more than ever, we need, to take, we need to tackle the unfinished business of reconciliation. We know that the 6.2 million Australians who voted yes are committed to better outcomes for First Nations people and are with us. It is imperative that supporters of reconciliation stand up to defend and uphold the rights of First Nations people, to call out racism wherever, wherever we encounter it, and to actively reinforce the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across this continent. Now more than ever, the work continues in treaty making, in truth telling, in understanding our history, in education, and in tackling racism. We need connection, we need respect, we need action, and we need change. Now more than ever, we need reconciliation. Thank you. Today at the University of Sydney, we are celebrating and acknowledging the conversations, discussions and systemic and structural changes that have come from Uncle Koiki Mabo le legacy. Jane Stanley, the director of the Gadigal Centre, will open with some remarks about this special day. Jane is a proud Aboriginal woman with ties to the Wiradjuri country from her family in Wellington, New South Wales. In a distinguished career, Jane has served in leadership roles with the Department of Education, recently acting in substantive deputy principal and relieving principal roles at Matraville Sports High School. Jane has worked in Aboriginal education, developing a number of successful outreach programs, connecting Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander students with entities such as the Aboriginal, uh, sorry, the Sydney Opera House, the Go Foundation, the New South Wales Art Gallery, and the Powerhouse Museum, along with the New South Wales Parliament. Please join me in welcoming Jane. Good morning. Um, good morning, Lisa. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you all here today. Um, I think what I was so... 3rd of June, 1992, um, 
The Mabo case was successful in overturning the myth or the legal doctrine that um, terra nullius or, of, or land belonging to no one. Um, so for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that very much is um, part of our truth-telling story that finally we were recognised um, as being here for, for over 65,000 years and that our laws and customs were actually a part of, of society. So I know I kind of am going to change because after Craig and, and Uncle Michael or Uncle Alan, um, they've talked very much about it. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Murray Island or Mur Island uh, with a group of students back in 2018. We visited the grave of, of Eddie Marbo um, and I can't tell you, uh, for the students that were there and, and for um, the Aboriginal staff that were there from World Vision, it was just such a, a powerful um, a powerful visit and I'm not sure I didn't know this up until then but the reason that Eddie's that the reason that his grave was moved back to Mur Island was because it had been desecrated on the, on the mainland um, so that's you know that is in itself is just such a, a sad story that knowing what Eddie Marbo had done for for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to then, um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit, I get, I get very emotional when I talk, I'm terrible. But um, it's just, it goes towards where we are and where we are in society. So I think that tells a really poignant story um, that even, even in recent times, that, that, that racism and, and desecrating a person who's been such a such a, um, a warrior for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that that, that happened. Um, you know, Eddie Marbo, he was committed to obtaining justice for, for all people, for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, and, and ensuring the recognition of traditional land rights for our people. So in 1993, was 12 months later after the, the Marbo case, um, the Native Title Act was passed, which has been such a significant thing for, for our people. Um, it, 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 um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit. It, it's just such a significant time and I think Marbo Day for all, you know, coming off the back of Reconciliation Week, it's fantastic that we talked that now or never, we talk about truth telling and as, as an educator um, and as an Aboriginal person, I know that, I, that that is that is what we need. We need to we need Australian the Australian community to really learn about the history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, Islander people, and we need it to come from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that truth needs to be told. As an educator in school for you know over twenty years, I did a lot of professional development with staff, and I think that. Education is definitely, you know, you are all educators, academics and professional staff here at the University of Sydney. It's so important that we all know about the real truth of, of Australia and I think with that comes empathy and comes reconciliation and, you know, the recognition and rights for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Luani and, and the team, um, Craig and the team, for inviting me to talk talk today. Um, and I hope that I'm sure that it will all go well for the rest of the day. It's lovely to see you all here. So, you know, coming along to these events, to our reconciliation events and, and also to Marbo Day, we also will have NAIDOC Day um, coming up. We'll have hold many events across the university for, the, for there as well. Just a quick, the Gadigal Centre. You know, the Gadigal Centre's been open since April uh, 2021. Everybody is more than welcome to come down to the Gadigal Centre. We do hold community lunches. We have over 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students um, enrolled at the University of Sydney. We really have built a community down there at the centre. You know, it's um, 
the University of Sydney is, is, a, is a big place with over 73,000 students. So I think what the, the, team, the team and I have done down at the centre is really create that safe space for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, but also for staff, for our Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal staff as well. So if you would like to come down for a visit or come down for a community lunch one day, I'd love for you to do so. Please just send me an email, jane.stanley, that's my, that's my email, but please do come along. Um, I think then you can meet with some of our students and, and really be a part of what we've created down there at the, at the Gadigal Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for those very powerful and emotive opening remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the great work that you do at the Gadigal Centre and with your team who are all here today sitting right up there. Hello. Um, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker for today, Toby Siddhar. But before we get into it, Toby is a proud Torres Strait Islander man born in Dampier, Western Australia in 1978 his bloodlines being from both eastern and western islands of the Torres Strait. His parents moved to mainland Australia from the islands, like many other Torres Strait people, for work on a railway, which took them to western Australia. Growing up in WA, Toby was always surrounded by his Torres Strait culture, with a large family and Torres Strait community around him. He was taught the importance of his culture by his elders, who passed, down, who passed them down to him in traditional ways, practices like dancing, and hunting and protocols. Toby Dunn his, has completed his schooling, sorry, in Port Hedland until receiving a football scholarship and moving to Perth to play representative football for Western, Western Reds and representing his state. Sorry, excuse me. In his early career, um, his work took him to New South Wales where he met his wife and had his three sons and changed careers and went into underground coal mining. In 2009, while still working in the mines, he started his own business, CDA Barlas Designs, a small business which he worked part-time designing and printing Torres Strait Islander design clothing and accessories. From this, he taught himself to use graphic design programs and realised his love for design and art, which led him to begin to make traditional Torres Strait Islander diary, which are headdresses. After being taught the ways of making them from his elders, he had now found his true passion. Toby's career in arts so, uh, shared with his wife, made the decision to make the move to North Queensland, not only so he could progress with his art work and business, but so that their children could learn more about their language and culture and be more, be more surrounded by it. Toby worked out of his workshop, creating his art and also doing wide format sublimation printing, where he spent the next five years, but has since moved back to New South Wales for other work and art opportunities. Since 2011, he has been involved in both solo and group exhibitions. In 2020, he was awarded the 3D Sculpture Award at the CIAF Art Awards. 2021, he was selected as a finalist in the 2021 Telstra NATSIAA Awards, and in 2022, has been selected as a finalist in the 67th Blake Prize. Toby enjoys creating both traditional and contemporary works, which are all heavily influenced by his Torres Strait culture, his totems, his father's stories of childhood, early adulthood on, and early adulthood on the islands. Please welcome Uncle Toby with me as he shares his personal stories and experiences with us today. Hello. Can you hear me? My name is Makamanali, I'm very good. I'm going to be a Toby Sita. What I said there was, my name, hello, welcome. Good morning, Debbie. Makamanali, I'm very good. How are you today? Good? Good. 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 That language comes from the eastern island of um, Torres Strait, Zenatkes, and that's our identity, um, as, long as, uh, as part of our stories as well. 
Um, I'll talk today about uh, my upbringing as um, a younger generation on the decision that was made, how it, it inspired me as, as an islander growing off country. Um, and it wasn't by choice. It was a um, decision that was made for our family when the Perlin industry died in Zenatkes. Um, a lot of the families went to, uh, when that uh, time of history, when the Perling died, our family came down to the mainland in Queensland, North Queensland, either they went to the cane fields or the railways. Mine went to the railways and then from there went straight to uh, Western Australia. In Western Australia, we have um, a record broken by our people that came and built the track in Mount Newman, and we, it's a world record. But the, much, much as you know that, that we hold that world record, seven kilometres in one day track laid by my ancestors. Come from the Torres Straits, build the track. And we beat the Americans. So we got one away from them. Uh, There's a monument in Mount Newman that was um, erected, nothing? Erected uh, a couple of years ago in honour of, of the, of the, um, of the elders who have done that. And there's also um, a play, I think it's in August this year about it. Um, that's um, when I got asked to come and talk up here about um, on this certain day, whatever, whatever, who I am today is it because of what decision was made and it makes us prouder to be, to stand up and it was a domino effect for all the First Nations. We have an acknowledgement now of country to, to say that the traditional owner owns this land. Because Kokiata beat Terranalius. We have a history that goes way back. And he, he, he showed them his boundaries and I went out to the sea. And we are the people of the land, sea and sky. We have winds that, that represent us. Constellation. They are part of our, of, of our civilization, a society that we have. In our ceremonies, the Dari headdress plays a big part. And when it's explained, it's, it's not a five minute explanation. It can go for days. Because once it's explained, every single piece that's on that headdress, that dari, from side, the feathers all the way around, to the framework. And that's the story in the front. Then you have another story behind. But it's only passed down, not by this, or looking at this, by this. And that's the importance of having, for me, um, constant um, communication with my elders as guidance, because they paved the way for us. And every artwork that I do, or song and dance that I create, are guided by my elders. Language and storyline. Because they're our knowledge holders. Um, with the artwork that I create, um, I was taught from 
my dad's brother, um, Uncle Ken Taide. He started me off on my journey. I sat down with him because I grew up, when I, when I learned how to dance, I danced his father's dances only. No one else would. We had two, two sides on, on Erub, down the island. You had Koki and Sagir. We were Koki. And I learned them songs growing up. And then when I come now to this generation, from the, from the intermarriage and all that through the Zenath case, you, you see um, a lot of people dancing other people's dances. And I, said, and I questioned, I said, why? Because them stories and dances that I danced belong to our land, our tribe. That's all I knew and, and I was supposed to dance. Because them other dances that everybody likes to hear and see from that tribe or another island is their story to tell. And that comes down to what Kokiata said about his land and what it means to him and his stories to tell. And that's the way I was taught. And that's the connection there. Oh, we're on. The slides are working. So some of that stuff I just talked about will be in, in the slide and all that. Um, are you trying to me? So, I got bloodlines that goes to eastern and western on my dad's side, Erub and Mer, and my mum is Moa, St. Paul Village. Um, my totem is Wada, Sap, which is Driftwood, um, Deger, or Dangal from my mum's side, and Opno Bays on Tiger Shark. I have also two window identities from Erub and, and, and Mer. Koki, Koki Wag, Northwest Winds, and Sagir Wag, the Southeast Winds. And the Morning Star is also my identity. Today, that's, that's the big, big part that we can explain. We belong to the land. On, on Erub, I got my father to explain all lay out all the family names that he can remember growing up, my two fathers, and I said, write down on the map there. So I know when I see family, I know when I hear their last name, I know what village they're from or what their land is. Because going, going back, why I was named Toby Cedar. Um, Because of, when I was born, sorry, when I was born, my mother wanted to call me Jeff after my dad. And my dad's mum and dad stepped in and said, no, you have to call this boy Toby, because I was the first son. And I was, okay. Mum was upset, so growing up in, in our ways, because my big daddy's name was Toby, you could, they couldn't call me in front of him, my name. So I had TJ or Jeffrey. So when I went to school, my first day in primary school, I went to primary school and I sat down. They, I was excited and they, and they, they named, they called the roll out. It was Billy, Billy Blank and then um, Joel Smith and then Toby Cedar. I'm looking around and I said, this fellow's got the same name as me. <laughs> I'm looking around and, and the teacher yelled out, Toby Cedar. And I looked around and then she came up with a roll book and said, you're Toby Cedar. And I said, no, I'm Jeffrey. They said, no, you're Toby. And then as I... Growing up and knowing now 
There is, today, there is eight Toby Cedars alive. We all share the same name, but different middle names. But we have to keep that name for that land. And that was the purpose of my name. And I didn't understand, my mother didn't understand. But that, why we had to carry that name on. And being young, I didn't know, but to now, it plays a big part. They have songs about my dad's dad. How they honour him when he was the captain of a lugger boat, Dahlia. And they spell his name T-O-B-Y-C-E-D-A-R in the language. So, just go through these, these slides here. These are pictures of our um, society um, before 1871. And I'm gonna, how, how our ancestors lived and all that. And I'm going to explain to you what... Does anybody know what happened in 1871? Because... Uh, and this is... What I'm going to talk about now is what I see and it's my interpretation of what's happening since 1871. Um, we used to, we had our rituals and ceremonies, which was, we weren't allowed to perform or interact with when the missionaries came. This is one of the, this is our God here, we, 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 are, we are in the ceremony, that was part of the, um, the 12 laws that Kokiata recited that we go by. A lot of these, a lot of these ceremonies are lost and um, not done today because of what happened. The next one. No, I'll go to this. So, so this, this, these masks here, we call Leop. There's only a hundred left, hundred left in the world, and we own none. That that were used as um, death funeral masks. But they were cast as devilish ways. The the hair on the on the on the mask is the is the person who passed. That's his hair. Le le is human. Opt is face. So they try to mimic. The head craftsman will try and mimic. The, um, the person who, of, of, um, who's passed away with turtle shell. So the mask are made from turtle shell, all down, shaped, and sewn together. And the hair we call moose. This is hair from his head and his beard sewn on. And there's a ceremony that gets played that that, that happens when, um, when the person's passed away and then they wait for a sign. The sign is what we call Mayer, shooting stars. And that's the, the sign of the bodies going to the land of Baig, to the afterlife. This one. So they, it's... With the guidance of our elders, we are the artists making new masks and artifacts, songs and dance to tell the stories of today for the future generations. To look back, but with different meanings, with the change in cultural practice. So when, when I asked about these masks, because when I was taught, I grew up in a, in a Christian background. But 
I didn't receive it. I, I couldn't. Something inside me didn't want me to receive it. And, and I apologise if any religious people are in here, but these are my views. And this is my experience. I was given so many Bibles every year. I had to stack that high next to my bed. But I just couldn't open them. And then when I went, I asked the, my, my parents about when I was young, these kids AG with the diary and the mask. They said, oh, the devil things, you can't talk about them. And I was like, oh, okay. And I left it when I was young. And then now, when I was on my journey of learning the spiritual side and, and all our history, it came to find out that these played a big part in our society, our identity on who we are. But we were told not to do it because it was devilish ways. So now, the artists of today are bringing out new masks, but with different stories and meanings. It may not have the... Um, the spiritual aspect that we had, the ancestors had back then, but we're still creating new songs and stories now, which we have to do. We have to make new, new stories now, like these two, um, my ones here, this one is called... Um, What's this one? Koki <laughs> Kerker, sorry. It's a, the seasonal mass, the, the north, northeast, northwest season. And on the, on the end of the, of the mass, I created uh, fish, fish tails. And it's fish going into what we have around the islands called Sai. They're stone fish traps. And then all the carvings on there, with the turtle, and all the stuff that's, that's done in that time, in that season. And there's frigate birds going all the way around. Carvings of frigate birds. The frigate bird, the wada, is our, is our, um, is like our calendar. When it, when it arrives, it's the start of that season, the wet season. And what that, that one bird can bring, we know what, fish is running, what food they harvest, and what weather it brings. And when that bit, one bird leaves, it's the start of the next season. This one over here I created, and it's called Lycobop, which means many faces. I didn't want to make one just like my ancestors did because that was somebody's face. So I created one with many different pieces and made that. This one here is one of my um, contemporary version of the um, shark masks. I've got that in a few institutions around Australia. Um, but it's just knowing to know uh, your your, your, your boundaries on contemporary and tradition. Because if you don't know your traditional side, you'll make mistakes and create stuff that's sensitive and you don't know. If you don't know, ask the question. And that's why whenever I create anything, I show my elders first. If they say you've got to change the whole thing, well, I've got to pull it apart and change it again. I tell them the story. So 1871 is when the missionaries came to Dunley Island and they bought um, the Bible. As in the first couple of slides, we had our own society and civilization. Every July 1 on Arab and 
throughout Zenith Cares, um, they celebrate the coming of the light. Um, yeah. The coming of the light in 1871, July 1, was uh, the London Missionary Society came. Samuel McFarlane brought eight Melanesian teachers from Lifu Island, welcomed by the chiefs on Eru, Dabad. They left Arab on the 5th of July, spread the rest of the word throughout Zenith Kez. Reenactment of the landing of the London missionary is played out every July 1. The in impact on society today we've adapted as we were already spiritual people. And the question that I was asked from my elder, all my elders was, who creates culture? We do. So. Now I'm going to tell you what you've never been told. When they came, we weren't allowed to speak our language, we weren't allowed to dance. They bashed and raped our women and killed our men if we did. They grabbed all our masks, headdress and drums threw them on the pile and burnt them. Hence why there's no masks left. And whatever they liked, they took. And they say it's been, it's been donated. No, no le. It's not been donated, it was stolen, taken from us. They put colourful material on my ancestors, on our rope. Ninety percent died from measles. Then they turned around and said they saved us. Not there. Everything that we did, they, they, they destroyed our shrines and what, all our beliefs and said they were devilish ways. Everything that they destroyed was devilish ways. But that only did happen on, on Arab, it happened around the world. So I created this mask here that glows in the dark. It was a finalist in the Telstra Awards. And I call it Neti Kanali, which who means who am I? And the question that I ask who am I is to my own people. He's asking to your own people because the story, the history of him is lost, gone. So when, before we press send, me and my wife, before we press send to send to the Telstra Awards, I was nervous to show my mum and dad because they're full-on Christians. So when that night before we were the deadline, we had an hour to send it, so we sent it to Western Australia and showed them. I just sat there and waited for the phone call. I was nervous. And the phone call came and said, it's the truth. And I said, I'm sending it in. I said, yep. And on, on my journey, I see re religion is on this hand and you have culture on this hand. This is a choice. This is my identity. I was stuck in, like, I was in two worlds and now I've jumped into this side because this doesn't identify who I am. This does. And it goes back to my name for the land, songs and dances that we sing about and who we're singing about and who we honour 
And in today's society, and I don't blame anybody, like I said, culture, we adapt to it. But this is my view. And what I see and I hear from different comments throughout, the, throughout our community is that there's a lot of our culture is heading this direction to the religious side. instead of going this way. For me, I compose and choreograph all my songs about my father. I honour the men that come before me. Not the men over here I don't know. There's a lot of songs I honour. Amen, Baba. But that's their choice. But this is who we are. Like Kokiata said, that everything he said, everything belonged, these things belong to our land. Our identity. And there was a comment I, I, I seen two weeks ago. Our people need a hero. <laughs> Not this guy. Before you honour anybody, honour your, your ancestors come before you. Because they made the way for us. Like Granddad did. From that decision... It's made every First Nations people in this country so proud to be who they are and acknowledge where their land is and what comes from that land. And going forward today is we're all learning together. That's all. So this artwork over here, Auntie Gal Marbo, um, curated a, um, an exhibition, a touring exhibition went for, it felt like it went for years. Was it three years? Three years that toured Australia. They went overseas. Um, the Legacy Tour, and I'm just, we only got an email, they won an award in Queensland as well, so it was great for that. And we, we all got picked from all over Australia, all different artists, to tell their story about what Granddad did for us. And that's what I did on our identity from the um, Kamenkin and Mirian Nation. That plays a big part in our society when it's explained. Um, and the turtle mask there with the face on it, what our master created from. I created this, this canoe here, we call Nar, um, for an exhibition, um, what was it, in Maitland. And it tells the story of our ancestors trading through our Zenith Kez and um, our team will perform you a song about that today. Now this, this is another song that I created about my dad. That the story that he tells me that comes in here, this is what you see. So he told me about this. There will be probably 10 boys lined up on a home reef in Dunley Island. They'll be lined up. They'll have two spears. And as the mullet's coming through, they'll, they'll spear the fish. Spear the fish, and, it, and they grab the rope and put the rope through. That we call it segem. And they seg the fish, and he turn around and say to the next boy down there, segem barada. That means the fish is coming down. And as that's doing that, it goes on and on and on. And that story was told to me when I was younger for my dad. And I made a song called Larada Kub Naispeker, segem segem barada. That means the fish are coming left and right. And the boys are jumping left and right with the spears. These, these um, instruments here um, underused on the eastern island of Zelenkes. And you can see this in one of Grandad's photos when he's sitting down, it's hanging up behind him. 
Because all around the Eastern Island, uh, the water is black from, from all sudden. And this is the instrument we use there. And it's a, and accompanied by two bamboo poles. Um, and they scare the fish into the middle and the guy jumps in and scoops it up. And the boys will show you that, that, that story um, after I finish talking. Because um, my... Because when the introduction of cast nets, that's when we started using um, cast net and that they were gone. So my dad never used it, I never used it, but my granddad used it. That's where I got the story from. And I'll explain that story when we, when we come to it. This one here is about Keriyamwada. It's about a mask I created on Dunn Island. All the frigate bird goes to our land. Kariam. So it's it's about creating new stories about um, our land, but with the song and dance. Good one. With the with the song and dance, you. When I explain um, to my kids, it's good to dance, then them all dance. But who's creating new ones here for there? Don't go down this road. We have to keep telling our stories here, and that's the songs and dances we're going to show you today is I honour my father for many stories. And I expect my children to make songs for me. Because if you don't, if you keep doing what's back there, there'll be a gap in the generation. If there's a gap, then these, these, these children here will turn around and say, what come from there? You must continue on what our ancestors did. And that's where I'm inspired by Granddad, what he done. Because that's who we are. And when I look back on my bringing, on my dancing, everything that I did, I only dance from where I come from, my island, my tribe, that's it. Today, everyone wants to dance new dances because it look good or sounds good. You can't because you dance. If I come here and dance, that, person, that island's dance there, and I'll make their movements, it'll have no meaning. It'll be light. Because it's not my story to tell. My story is over here. Talk about my family line, my history, my fathers. Basically what I said there. All the songs, it's about the weather, the land, who goes out in the lugger boat, who comes back in the canoe from trading. That's our storytelling. Like, I'm, I'm sorry if everybody's gone singing about Amen Baba, but you're not making, you're not making any footprints here or, or in our timeline to go forward. But like I said, they're, only, they're, they're, my, they're my interpretations and what, I, what I've learnt. And now when I've come across to this side, we've got, I can see everything clearer. So we, our dance group we've got here is called Mui Mui Bume Gedlam, which means deep sounds from home. We, we dance songs, that, we're all family there, we're from Arab Island and Murray Island. But we try to compose and use new songs and dances. Um, and we're guided, I'm guided by my elders. 
on the storyline in Miriam Mir, the language. So with, with this, the performances that we do, we, we put in um, for dance rights last year. And we only just got in because they weren't going to put us in because they didn't have enough performers. They had enough, they said, and I said, You've, the closing date's two days' time. And I went on. And when we got in, we practiced and rehearsed all the new songs and dances, but we had, I created a, a mask. You didn't put the mask there. No. A mask about um, the frigga bird. And uh, it goes with two other songs with it. And there was two categories that we put it into, um, wild card and the traditional dance. One's eight minute, one is three minutes. And when we were rehearsing the first time, we got together and we put everything together. We tried to fit the mask dance into an eight minutes and we couldn't. It didn't feel right, did it? Yeah. And then we tried to do um, Gillam, the canoe dance, in the three minutes, and we think it needed a longer, longer spot. So after that, because we were back and forth, because we live in Newcastle, so we travelled back and forth from um, Newcastle to Sydney to rehearse. And then after rehearsal, we went back home. The next day, I worked on the mask. And as I, as I was working on the mask, the mask said to me, do not use me for the eight minute. Use me for the wild card. And then I rang my niece straight away. I said, Beatty, the wild card. We'll use the mask for the wild card. And we use all them other songs that we got and dances together. And we put it into one big dance. So from there, we rehearsed. And we just had to believe. We had to believe in the stories that we're telling. And those stories that we were telling were stories that I was told. And what a lot of people don't know, that we were creating footprints here in this generation. And that was dance right was originally about you're supposed to dance new song and dances, not old dances. You're supposed to make new songs and dances to keep the culture alive, the language and the stories. So as we went on, we made it to the finals and then we won. But before we went on, I already told the kids, everybody, we got together and I said, no matter what, you've already won in my eyes because you're telling the stories of my father. And then my niece said, honor, honor granddad, honor me for what I did. And I said to my sons, honor your dato, your granddad. <coughs> Smash the ground because these are our stories to tell. Same what granddad did. He told his story to the court and he won. That's the man who inspired me. You should inspire all of us. And that was his timeline, and that's the main thing that stood out for me, was the second one. The laws that he abide by. He told that law. Showed him his boundaries. Our ways. Terry Nalius. Nolly. Yep. So I'll just finish off um, yeah, that was just something I just put together today. I just wanted to speak from my heart as well, from what I got taught and what I know that's more important is to keep going forward with my culture. And knowing I feel, I feel good about what I do 
because of what Grandad did. Um, and I pass on what I know to my children who will make a difference in the future with carrying on our culture. So I'll just finish off by saying I will swear. Big thank you.
That one there, um, I've written about my two fathers because um, I can't go back to Errol now as health reasons um, and travel. So every time we get together, I always talk about and reminisce about Errol, their home. Um, and the first line is that they think of their home on sunset. And the next line is that one day we'll meet again. And what, what stood with me is that when I, when I hear that they can't go back now, it breaks my heart because how passionate they talk about home. So I pictured them sitting together and talking about their young days as the sun goes down. And one part in there, when the boys did this movement, like that, when, when my big daddy went home, and he always told me this, and he stuck with me when I was younger. He said, when I got off the plane, when I flew into Erub, when I got off the plane, he got off the plane, he went like this. He grabbed the earth. That's who we are. That's, that's what he said. He said, when you grab that, he said, I'm home. He put the soil on him. No matter how dirty his, his face looked or his body, he said, a part of me, I'm back. So the, the next one we're going to do now, where is it? Is the sardine scoop, the one I was telling you about. So this one, the first part is about going down through the shoreline and seeing um, if there's any fish. And the second part of the song is um, the wherest, the sudden scoop would be full today. So that's the meaning of this song.
Sing a sing a song here. Um, this song was let's give the dancers a quick break because we're all recovering from illness. A bug we've all caught. This song we're going to sing now is one I composed for my. <coughs> you all can relate to this. Um, COVID. So when COVID came, I was supposed to go back to see my family in Western Australia. Um, but couldn't go because of COVID lockdown. We've all experienced lockdown. You can't leave your suburb. You can't leave, you know, the state. No matter what reason. And it was ten years since I seen my siblings. Um, probably about five since mum and dad, and we're all very close. So when this come in, we were set to go, and when. The new laws come in, and it was a shock to everybody. So I was sitting at my in-law's place um, across, over the water um, on the balcony, and my wife and kids were all on the side having a good time, and I was sitting outside thinking about my family, thinking that I should be there. And I was, as I was thinking of them, the sun was going down, and the wave come over. When the wave come over, I seen their faces in the wave. <coughs> and that's what this song's about. And when I seen their faces in the wave, it was uh, the picture that I seen when we were all young together. That's when I was skinny too. I love that photo. Um, yeah, but what got me through COVID was this song. And as I was sitting on the back and when I seen their faces, I got emotional. And I closed my eyes and spiritually I jumped in the water and turned into a tiger shark. And I swam all the way around to the Western Australian border. Then the water exploded and I turned to a frigate bird and I flew home and got to see him. So every time I sang this song for the two years, I thought of that. And then when I got to go home, two, uh, was it two years since COVID finished? Oh, yeah, August. I remember it was August. I flew home and I sang it to him. There wasn't a dry eye. Um, so this one is called Carrot Care. So it's exactly... And we'll sing it. So I teach at a school one day a week at my, kid, my son's school. Um, it's a, hunt, a performing art school and it, it inspires me every time I go there. Um, so there's a young lady, Billy Tiffin Wright, um, She's in the school for um, drama. And in, the, in this class that I was teaching, I utilise drama, dance and music to utilise their skills and, um, with my song in language. And she composed the English part, uh, the melodies and all that. And she created a three-part harmony with the young girls. And it was beautiful. So I just want to acknowledge young Billy who composed the English part, and then we'll go into the um, language part. Um, this is Curried Kim. <coughs>
Yeah. I'll sit down, paddle off. Right. I'll sit down, paddle off. Get on and sit down. Yep. Yeah. The next one we're going to do is um, this one is called Gelam. Uh, it's about a big, big story. In Zanat's case, I grew up listening to this story being told to us. Um, our creation story of all the Jugongs in Zanat's case. He, he basically ran away from his mother, made a canoe, and went to every island from Moor Island in the Western Islands, and now where um, he lays today in Murray Island, and the island shape is um, on one side, Gillam, Jugong. Um, and when he went to every island, he made a landmark. So when he went to the second last island, Erub, he made a passageway called Rzikez. And this is what this one's about, um, that passageway, leaving um, Moalam to uh, Erub. <laughs> The, um, the one about the, our ancestors coming back from trading in the canoe, we call it Nar. Um, when they're coming back, they could be out for months trading throughout the Torres Straits. Um, the women will be left behind and they were taught to use what we call Sadiq Sadiq Kep, bow and arrow, to go hunting and to also protect from invaders as well. So the women played a big part in our society as well, as the men did when out and traded. So this one's about coming home from trading, and when they're coming close to home, Ged, they see the top of the hill, Al Paster, to the Zalbe of the wave. And when they see that, their hearts lift up and they paddle faster home. And as the Sagerwag, the southeast wind, catches the sails, they're paddling fast and it turns the canoe straight for Ged. So you see the movements of the kids here. This one's called Nanar Bre. And this is our last one.
Thank you for having me and my family come and perform and for you to listen to my story. That's only a small story on my upbringing and, and who I'm, I'm guided by. The strong ancestors before me is who I follow. So, happy Mabe Day. I will swear. Wow, thank you. How absolutely deadly was that? That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, just before we hand over to our closing remarks, just a quick thank you to DVCISS for all of your assistance today with the AV and our amazing caterers, and then Neil, our amazing photographer over here in the corner. I would just like to hand over to our CHRO, Sam, for some closing remarks. Well, it's, it's pretty hard to top that, I have to say, and um, I know I'm standing in the way of lunch and there's no way I can compete with that incredible uh, performance. But look, let me just say I, I really want to thank, I want to thank uh, Uncle Michael who started off today uh, telling us to show love and I think there's no better way than what Uncle Toby's done for us here today and the... Um, these incredible dancers have done. They've shown us love through some really powerful stories. I've been listening to those stories on the edge of my seat. Um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to share them with us today. And I appreciate everyone coming here and spending time uh, listening to those stories and taking time out of their day for this uh, momentous day. I remember being a university student when uh, the Mabo decision was handed down. It was a monumental uh, decision at the time. Um, and if I think back then to now, the biggest difference or one of the biggest differences that I'm so very happy to hear is people proudly saying always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I think that's a, a wonderful uh, legacy that I hear all the time now, which is just wonderful. Um, uh, given we are a bit over time, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank the wonderful diversity and inclusion team that are in my team. Um, Craig, you've done a wonderful job today doing the MC. You really slayed it, so thank you. Um, thank you. And I want to thank Luani and Annabelle, who are also here for uh, creating this day for us today. Uh, and we have lunch outside. We also are showing the Marbo movie for those of you who can stay or for anyone who wants to come back uh, with a bite to eat and watch the Marbo movie. Thank you very much for today. I really appreciate it. And thanks again to our wonderful um, Toby and the Myo Myo dancers. Thank you. <laughs>